Okay, let's get things started. I am going to introduce uh, Jeffrey Hansen and James Hursthaus, who's going to tell us all about the opportunities in the metaverse, because this Vantech meeting is themed about the metaverse. And we hold these Vantech meetings every single month, and we've been doing that since April 99. And lately, for the last few years, we've been alternating these Vantech meetings with general themes and special themes. And you lucky people, we're in one of the specially themed months, opportunities in the metaverse. And I am going to introduce Jeffrey and James. Take it away, you two. Hello, everybody. So um, I'm going to speak first, and then uh, I'm going to introduce James, and uh, and um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll cover this topic as best we can. Um, I've interesting thing is uh, I'm uh, <clears throat> I'm work in an investment bank, Garibaldi Capital Advisors. I track uh, a lot of these tech markets in terms of what's going on. A lot of you probably know me from Rocket Builders, Ready to Rocket. Um, I have this little blue bubble here. Eighty-seven hundred investment pitches attended so far, and uh, you know I'm going to watch another four or five today. So we're going to add to that number. So. Um, <clears throat> Let me jump right into what I'm going to talk about today. So I'm going to talk for about 20 minutes to give you a background on the space. You know, what is the metaverse? You know, what is, you know, what, what does a company do? How do they make money? Um, you, know, you know, what's going on in the space? Is there a lot of investment going on? Um, you know, how do these companies get traction? And then talk a little bit about, um, you know, what are the challenges of investing in these companies? So I can advise you investors to understand how to look at these companies because they are a little different than maybe a traditional SaaS software investment in terms of the dynamics of the IP and the, the, you know, the, the, the revenue flows and things like that. So I'm gonna run you all through that. Then I'm gonna introduce uh, James, who's an entrepreneur that's worked in the space and who's at the very leading edge. And he can share uh, his you know, uh, insights on what's hot in the space and you know, what he's learned from being this leading edge entrepreneur. And we'll now ask questions um, at, towards the end. So I think it's going to be a very interesting hour. So first of all, background on the metaverse. So the metaverse was a concept, um, you know, first coined in 1992 in this book by Neil Stevenson. And uh, I had the opportunity to read it in 1992. I had the opportunity to read it again this last Christmas. I thought it'd be fun to see how the world has changed. Um, you know, it was a dystopian vision of the future where uh, everyone had to stay home and uh, the, all the power structure in the world was based on, you know, the ability to deliver food to people's homes. So, you know, no one can relate to that, can they? <laughs> so my experience with, uh, with what we today call the metaverse started in, uh, I started as a software engineer and my first video game was in 1980. So. I've been at this for a very, very long time. Um, for me, Tron was a, a key movie in 1982, which sort of transformed how I thought about the world. Before that, I was doing very two-dimensional games, and then there was this, uh, you know, great ex exhilaration that uh, I could start to think about games in the 3D space. Um, the very early uh, VPL research was a spin-out from Atari, which did all the original uh, VR. Uh, research. Uh, we used to read about that as gamers, uh, gaming developers, and we get very excited about it. And I had the opportunity as a gamer to get in 1989 this power glove, which went with the Nintendo Entertainment System, and these virtual I.O. glasses, which came from uh, Seattle startups, spun out of the University of Washington back in 1995. Um, and I got to play with these toys, and they barely worked but you know, I was so passionate that eventually someday that I'd actually see them working the way they were intended. And we're actually at that stage now and I'm quite excited to talk about it. Um, people are afraid of the metaverse because they have some preconceptions that I wanna talk about some of those myths. First of all, they're afraid they have to wear the headset everywhere to interact and no, that's not the case. I mean, the, at its purest form, uh, you're gonna wear the headset to get the, the most uh, intense experience, but all of the things that we're talking about in the metaverse are, are being designed so they can be experienced also on flat screens and on even on mobile devices. Um, 
the other preconception is that you have to have, you know, you have to be a rocket scientist basically, and, uh, and that the, this uh, technology was designed for engineers to understand 3D space. And no, the technology has evolved to the point where it's very, very simple and easy for the average uh, consumer. And so a lot of people have a negative uh, connotation with it, thinking this is some sort of, uh, you know, thing that Facebook's trying to force onto everyone where it's actually been something that's been developed for a long time and Facebook's just trying to co-opt this trend. But uh, I actually think they have very little play in this compared to all the other things that are going on in the industry. So there are many definitions for the metaverse. If you asked a dozen people, you'd get a dozen answers on what it is. And I'm gonna give you mine. And then when we get James on later, he'll give you his, uh, but the very broad industry definition is a virtual world of people can interact, socialize, enjoy entertainment, and conduct business. It's a very broad definition. And you notice I haven't didn't say in there that had to be a 3D visor I had to wear. You know, it's a very, very broad definition that captures a lot of opportunity. Um, but I have a very useful definition that I use for me to understand the space. And that is, that I look at it from the value that gets created. And the value that gets created by this thing we call the metaverse comes from creating brand new experiences that people want, uh, brand new marketplaces for people to do business uh, or to subscribe or you know, to en engage in uh, commerce. And it provides this other dimension of something very, very interesting, which is, digital asset ownership, that you can own something that gets used in the world that you interact with. And once you start to understand those three concepts, a lot of this stuff that people talk about that may never start to make sense in terms of what the real business value is. So why now? And uh, those of you that um, have attended some of these pitches with me and I, I query the, uh, the uh, entrepreneurs is I often ask that question. I think it's the most important question for anyone trying to raise money is to answer the question, why now? What is the opportunity? Why should I invest now versus wait you know, six months or a year before I invest? And what's interesting about what's going on here is um, I talked, for some reason, I'm the February guy for Vantech. I talked last February about the pandemic trends that were driving in, in, uh, investment. And I had mentioned that AR VR was one of the things that was being highly stimulated. Um, and that turned out to be true. It was highly stimulated, but there were other opportunities in the marketplace that came together at the same time. So there are many innovations and trends that converge at the same time. Um, you know, de uh, device power, um, you know, user audiences, uh, demand for new, new types of uh, experiences. All these things came together uh, in a unique way that we really haven't seen uh, very often. Um, and that has created a pent up demand and a market ready uh, to, to explode. And that was, that's what makes it very interesting. The last thing that happened in the last year is that is, is even more fascinating is that some very lifelike experiences became possible um, on very standard hardware. So I wanna talk about, uh, I wanna show you quickly a video and I have to sort of explain this that um, um, I'm gonna show you an experience that is possible with your PlayStation or Xbox. Uh, and it's made possible by technology by Un the Unreal Engine 5. And the theme is the matrix and Unfortunately, I may not do it justice because if you actually play on the console, it's actually very, very impressive that it feels like you're in a real world. But that lifelike experience is what the big breakthrough that's making the metaverse possible. And I'm going to show you just a minute of it. If you want to go back to it, I can send you the link and watch the whole video. But um, I could become immortal. Hi. I'm Carrie Ann Moss, and I played Trinity in the Matrix films. 20 years ago, we asked ourselves how long it would be before faces and bodies could be changed as easily as we change clothes. We wondered, what would identity mean in a completely digital world? And what would reality mean when a world we can build feels as real as our own? Which 
seven. Yeah, this is what they wanted. Said they were fine with your theoretical mumbo jumbo, but we need some sexy action. Come watch this with me. They're presenting like why the marketing people. Marketing. I thought we were supposed to have total creative control. Welcome to the matrix. Okay, so what I've showed you, shown here, is uh, actual experience in the game. This is not them shooting movie on the street. So there is, this is a 30 gigabyte download you can download into your Xbox or PlayStation. It gives lifelike experience. Um, there's over a billion different polygons in order to create this, this world. Uh, there's 35,000 different metahumans. There's over 7,000 buildings and over 35,000 drivable cars in that 30 gigabyte download that's available on anyone's PlayStation or uh, Xbox. So that is what the state of the art is in terms of can, what can we create that resembles the real world in the digital realm. So this convergence uh, uh, that makes this metaverse possible, there's actually seven layers to consider, right? And I mentioned earlier that the most important part was these new experiences. So experience is a top layer. Um, and we that experience is available today, uh, what it, but it's available in games and it's available in certain live events. But as we move forward, those experiences will be available in much broader contexts in terms of every social experience, every live event, every theater shopping experience will be there, right? Then, then there's also going to be, um, you know, a context of discovery where how do you find what's in the metaverse? Um, you know, there's going to be obviously advertising, there's going to be um, basic search and uh, some artificial intelligence that helps you navigate and get to what you want to do. It's all based on the creator economy that there's this broad audience. It's not one company making everything in that metaverse. Um, and that it all relies on that 3D engine that I just showed you the example of on the PlayStation that's available in every device, whether it's our iPhone, our computer, our, our playing console. All that level of GPU technology and intelligence is available in everyday devices today. Um, the challenge is, of course, is a lot of this stuff you know, our networks aren't optimized for and it's gonna to have to be because for us to have instant reaction that feels like the real world, we have to have very high bandwidth and we have to have very low latency. Um, and then we have to have different ways of experiencing that new experience. So we need the human interface, whether that's smart glasses, a wearable or some other flat screen representation of that new world. Um, so all these layers of technology have come together at the same time to create this opportunity. Um, and that lifelike experience, um, you know, is such a jump in terms of what's possible and all these things coming together, it's really unlike anything we've had in tech since maybe we launched this sort of app revolution on with smartphones uh, 10 years ago, or whether when we first started the internet, you know, 20 years ago. Um, it's that big a jump in terms of all the things that are possible and the number of people and devices that are ready for it. So it's a bit of a greenfield market and that, you know, those that are in the space first, there's going to be a huge advantage to being that. Just like when you were one of the very first apps on the Apple App Store, there was a huge advantage compared to later on. So that's why there's all this pent up demand and this opportunity for the metaverse. So whose metaverse is it? Um, well, in terms of the leading edge of the metaverse, there's obviously gaming companies like Fortnite. There's obviously an October Facebook renamed their name, their company Meta because they wanted to capitalize on it. Each of these companies have a different representation of parts of what we call the metaverse. Um, you know, they don't necessarily own it. And in fact, in the ideal world, there's an open environment where all these technologies work together so that uh, if you have your virtual Nike sneakers, that's the virtual Nike sneakers you wear in every video game and every environment you go to. Uh, we're not quite there yet, but that is the promise of, of the metaverse. On the left here, I showed that what, what uh, NVIDIA calls the omniverse, where they're trying to combine 
different creator technologies with different uh, you know, technologies to deliver those experiences on uh, gaming systems or in computers or phones. Um, so there's a number of different ecosystems forming, but they're all moving towards this same sort of arc, open architecture view of the world. Uh, but there's, in the short term, you're gonna experience that if within a very, very specific context. It could be you're attending a live concert in Fortnite. It could be that uh, you're, you're engaging in some sort of social event in, in, in Meta, or you actually have some sort of other, uh, you know, maybe more business oriented experiences driven by the GPUs from NVIDIA and a bunch of other companies they're partnered with. Um, so they have a, all have a very different view of the world. So really who owns the metaverse? Well, many companies are creating parts of the metaverse and the promise of it is this is all gonna bring these different experiences together. And you know, depending on the experience you want, there may be a different metaverse platform you're going to to get that. So how big is this market? How fast is it growing? You know, uh, what's going on? Um, it is, uh, you know, initially started as a fairly small market. And what we call the, this uh, metaverse today in terms of a market, we measure in terms of what's going on in uh, basically in the gaming world and how that's evolved into that aspect of the metaverse. But as we start to layer in the other things that are the social platforms and we start to layer in all these other engagement technologies that are becoming available that become make possible you know, commerce in the metaverse, et cetera, we start to see more and more spend over time. And a 40% growth rate in the tech sector is probably makes it the largest high growth tech sector in the tech economy uh, going forward. And that is gonna translate into over 800 billion in spend by uh, 2024. And that stat comes from uh, Bloomberg. And you know, by the time we get to 2030, it's gonna have greater spend than the gaming live event and advertising markets combined. Because all of our digital, ex all of our experiences are gonna be connected through these digital experiences. So traditionally, uh, I, when I'm trying to analyze a market space and trying to understand where it is in terms of the adoption curve, there's two models I always go to. One is the uh, uh, crossing the chasm model by Jeffrey Moore, and the other is this Gartner's hype cycle, right? Um, both are useful for me when I'm trying to analyze an emerging technology market space, but uh, in the case of the metaverse, it's a little more difficult because there's so many different technologies coming together, so many different companies that have to partner to make things happen. And there's so many different sectors of the metaverse market that are moving at different speeds. So it's pretty hard to do, but you know, one publication says that the metaverse, unlike the typical Gartner's hype cycle that has a down, it's basically gonna be exponentially up because of all these things that continue to come together. It's not a one point of convergence, it's many years of convergence occurring over a number of the next few years. So the metaverse is rapidly able to accelerate adoption. Um, why we see it as such a huge market in the next three years is that you've, are, we've already aggregated the audience of gaming and social people that are gonna be involved in these metaverses. So it's not trying to find the audience, the audience is there. And the installed base of devices with sufficient intelligence, processing power, bandwidth, and display capabilities all are, are already in place. We don't have to wait for people to buy things. You know, before with VR, people saying, well, I have to wait till it's affordable for me to buy a headset. Well, that's likely to change in the next three years as well. But there's also the way the metaverse is evolving is that you can have that experience from a flat screen as well as from a, a 3D view. So how will this adoption occur? Well, it's gonna happen in multiple sequential waves. So everything is gonna move at a slightly different speed depending on the area that you're focused in. So um, we're obviously starting with gaming and marketing and you can see big brands are starting to invest in this significantly. Um, you know, then there's social, then there's events, uh, live events, education, commerce, communication and the workplace. So all these things are gonna phase out. Some of the more 
you know, pervasive things that affect how you work, maybe take three years from now before they become, uh, start to impact you. But you can see that all these things are at, a, at, at an early stage of adoption now, and then it's just a matter of time before they ramp up. An interesting uh, example for this would be looking at what uh, Nike as a company is doing. So if we envision what Nike is doing, uh, what they've done is they've envisioned that their brand has to be uh, sustainable you know, as we move into a digital world. And Nike has uh, invested the last six years in putting a lot of money into patents and researching how this is gonna go. So it's not just they started this today, Nike is the first Fortune 500 to have a chief metaverse officer. Um, their first foray is to offer NFTs where you can go online in a 3D environment, design your, uh, your, your kicks, your, your sneakers. Um, those sneakers today, um, you can have them as an NFT, or you can use that design as the basis of actually ordering the real world Nike sneakers customized that you want to buy. But the vision for the future is that those will also be the uh, sneakers that all of your avatars and all the various representations of you in the metaverse are, will, will wear. And there'll be recognition of that. And that's what Nike has made a significant investment of in making sure they're at the leading edge of that. So if we look at the companies building the metaverse, if we look at maybe perhaps maybe the top 100 companies that are already in place, um, they fall into this market map where we can see the different areas of technology innovation that's going on. So these are the really the leaders in the space. Uh, these are the companies that probably have had you know, over you know, $50 million invested already, if not more. Um, <clears throat> but there's also behind this 100 companies, there are thousands of startups active in, in various areas of this space. And if I actually did a market map for those thousand, there'd probably be Instead of these uh, eight categories, there'd probably be about 18 categories, right? Because it's spaces, there's a lot of innovation going on in different areas to fill gaps to make the metaverse possible. So how do these people make money? You know, what's the big, that's the big business question, right? Um, it's complicated is the answer. And let me try to do my best at explaining how companies in the metaverse make money. So the best way to start is how do those platforms make money? So I show an example here with Meta, which is, used to be Facebook, and with Roblox. So um, the, the Metaverse business model for Facebook is not too different from their Facebook model, that it's a combination of applications uh, and advertising. But there's also some interesting things where there's blockchain tokenized ownership of specific digital assets, and there's portability of digital items between different environments within that metaverse. So they expect for each of those actions to get, um, you know, transaction fees. And, you know, there's certain free entry into the metaverse initially, but anything you want to do, there may be a transaction fee associated with it. And there will probably be a bunch of advertising in that new environment. Roblox, you can see from this is a very different way of looking at how their revenue streams work in terms of they look at it in terms of how they have to share revenue with the ecosystem that's part of their uh, metaverse, right? So developers get a share, app stores get a share, um, and then different other things happen in terms of um, investments that Roblox has to do to maintain the metaverse in order to make all the revenue flow. So then when we look back that into the specific startups, those specific startups are either providing apps or they're providing um, digital assets or they're providing functional glue that gives you certain functionality in that metaverse transactional environment. And there's gonna be technology companies that enable marketing in the metaverse. There's gonna be technology companies that enable um, you know, media distribution. And there's gonna be uh, companies that simply um, help people customize, you know, their avatar to have certain attributes. So there's so many different revenue streams. What you're going to see that's challenging when you see a startup is you're going to see that um, there's no simple, it's not your simple SaaS company, right? And 
we've become too incremental with SaaS companies and they all have the exact same business model. So they're very easy to analyze. Um, and we've been spoiled by that. But when it comes to the metaverse, you'll find that some of them have a certain aspect of subscription, they'll have a certain aspect of usage fees, they'll have a certain aspect of transactional fees for certain things. So there, it becomes interesting about what the cross sell is, what the retention and how customer value grows over time. It's a very different dynamic than your typical SaaS company, but that's what makes it exciting to look at what's coming ahead with the metaverse. The key metrics uh, will be a combination of things that we looked at a SaaS company or what we might look at in a media company. There are how many active users there are, what's my average revenue per user, uh, what other things can I cross sell to those users once I capture them, and how can I retain those users? Do I have a sustainable community of people that want to keep coming back to me for that metaverse experience or for those transactions? So uh, my day job is an invested banker and I'm always looking at what's going on in the markets. And if we look at the public markets, there's been a lot of activity where people have been boosting their valuation by committing to the metaverse. Um, there's also been um, some sort of uh, interesting activity in terms of investment that, um, you know, this whole area of uh, crypto investors, as well as more traditional institutional investors, maybe like a Goldman Sachs that is to date been very anti-crypto, they have all been collaborating and in investment in a lot of these public ventures, which is interesting because basically they were on either side of the spectrum before this. So it's actually bringing a lot of stimulation in terms of new types of investment. Um, and because of that, we're gonna to start to see a lot of new types of deals. And you know, you may, if you believe the hype that I'm trying to share with you today, you might wanna even restructure your portfolio to think about how different companies may be worth more because of this. And uh, there's a number of ETFs and SPACs forming specifically around the metaverse. Um, but if we look at terms of a more traditional venture capital style investment or private equity style investment, we see that there's the stuff that we can measure is the stuff that you know existed for a few years. That's gaming, online games, augmented reality, virtual worlds. Um, but <clears throat> that doesn't capture all those thousands of smaller startups that I've been talking about because they haven't hit the institutional capital that we can track. Um, there's been some large local investments in Vancouver, you know, several hundred million dollars went into DAP for labs. Um, High Street is a promising uh, marketplace for NFTs uh, that's uh, received 5 million investment recently. Um, and then there's some very active, interesting types of investors that you may be not used to seeing all on the same screen. So there's a lot of corporate investors, the leading one being NVIDIA that has a vested interest in the metaverse. Um, then we have our traditional VC, traditional VC, Sequoia and Andreessen Horowitz have both established segments of their portfolio as VCs to focus this. And there's been more of this crypto focused uh, investment funds like Pantera and Coinbase that are also seeking to capitalize on the metaverse. So it's changing a lot of that. Um, and then there's all, on the corporate investment front, Sony took a minority interest in Epic Games where they invested $250 million to get only a small piece of Epic Games in order to have a play in the metaverse. The concern about you know, what's gonna happen in the metaverse has forced a lot of companies to, to make some very, very large acquisitions. Microsoft uh, acquired Activision very recently, PlayStation acquired Bungie and uh, Nike, based on that story, I told you what they're trying to do, acquired an NFT broker company. Um, and in locally in the Vancouver market, Unity acquired Ziva Dynamics, which was a very, very promising company uh, in order to, pull that asset into uh, their plans for the metaverse. So if we're interested in, in investing in metaverse companies, we have to have, understand a little bit about how they get commercial, how they commercialize their innovations. 
And uh, my traditional view of that was uh, I followed this traction gap formula where I used, is very useful for looking at SaaS companies where I would look at, you know, what's the minimum viable product. I would look at, you know, minimum viable revenue model. And then I would see a, a minimum viable level of traction that would drive scaling up of the company. So I would go through those sequences if I was looking at a SaaS company. I would take a very different perspective of uh, the metaverse because I don't think it's so, it's so linear or, or obvious. So in the metaverse, um, I don't have minimum viable product. I have something slightly different that I look at in sequence. So I would look at what's the minimum viable experience. How is this company creating an experience that people demand, right? And uh, what's the proof that they demand it and that, 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 uh, that they've satisfied the need for that? Um, and then I have to figure out based on that, I, I mentioned that revenue models are often multi-layered where there's different ways these companies make money. Um, so I need to make sure that there's a community of users that there's enough critical mass that there's enough going on there for there to be a revenue transaction base going so that the revenue can flow and they can get into those cycles of cross-selling other stuff. And I need to know that that meaningful experience they've created, that people don't just come, try it, and then disappear and churn, that they actually keep coming back and there's a sustainable utilization of the innovation they've created in the metaverse. So what are the dynamics that you have to consider as an investor? And the first shock that some of you are gonna get is that valuation is very different. Um, first thing you're gonna find is that the valuations of most of these metaverse companies is much higher than you'd see for your generic SaaS company. So we take that usual basis that we would look at a, you know, your standard tech startup and saying, you know, what's the team, what's the traction, what's the near term revenue opportunity. And uh, I think this, that company's, I'm comfortable with this valuation. The challenge is you have to look at, you know, if they're entering in the metaverse, what size of addressable market is possible from the way they're entering that metaverse, um, what partners they have, through those partnerships and that market access, what are the future revenue streams? And how deep is the intellectual property they have that give them a sustainable competitive advantage in what they're trying to do in the metaverse? And because that IP uh, is often man years of investment that have, has already occurred before they come to you for investment, um, these four pillars together, you know, we generally see much higher uh, valuations for um, seed stage investments of uh, metaverse companies. So I have some tips for investors because some of them, you know, some of the things I've said may get you excited, but also worried that, you know, what is it I don't know that I could be, af should be afraid of. Um, so first, make sure that company can answer that why now question, because some of, like I said, some of these innovations may take a number of years for people to be able to capitalize them. Are they ahead of the curve too much or is it the right timing? If you remember Hootsuite in Vancouver was an example of a company that had absolutely perfect timing of entering the market at the very right time of explosion of social media, right? So you can't just generalize that every company can be that next suite. You know, you have to be really think does this metaverse company have this opportunity to catch one of these early waves? Uh, it's a very different risk versus reward proposition, right? So some simple SaaS companies, I mean, there's very little risk, but you know, it's gonna be steady growth, but it's not gonna get huge fast. Uh, some of these uh, metaverse opportunities, there's going to be a significant amount of risk, but if they get over the hump, the reward's going to be significantly higher. So you have to think about that risk reward profile a little differently. Um, it's very important their ecosystem position and the partnerships they have. So, you know, what are the uh, big industry players that are going to help them get access to the market? Are they motivated to help them? You know, do they have enough juice? from those partnerships to get them to where they need to go. And are they focusing on simple steps to get there or are they trying to boil the ocean too quickly? Um, 
those of you who've seen my uh, webinar series at Venture Labs know that I always talk about the importance of a financial roadmap. So not just how much money they need today, but what is the call for cash over the next few years. Be clear, some of these companies will be, you know, once they get over the hump, they'll become very cash independent. Um, others will take many, many years to get to a cash flow positive situation because they are going to continually have to reinvest in content and other IP. Um, you'll have to do scenario analysis because for, you know, there's a number of ways you could see the metaverses that they're participating and evolving. So therefore, you know, you can't just have the simple, you know, it's going to take off viewpoint. You're going to say, these things in the market have to happen. When they happen, this is when this will take off and understand those scenarios. Um, and some companies you're just going to say no to because they've tried too hard uh, to layer too much together that makes it that there's too many moving parts. So, you know, I've seen a lot of business plans lately that have an NFT component to it. But for me, they're just piling on more onto a bad value proposition, a bunch of other things that are trendy. Um, so you're gonna have to sort through that as to are they actually gonna get where they need to go and then are they gonna be able to layer on this other stuff. And be careful of false economy because some investors I've seen get caught by thinking that they'll make a small amount on the company but they'll make even more money on the tokenized economy being created by this company. Um, it's very dangerous thinking. So uh, I wanted to say that if you want to see my slides, just please just send me an email, jeff at garibaldicapital.com and I'll, I'll happily share what I've just shared with you. And I'll also share you an invite to our uh, forecast event on what's going on in investment in the tech sector. Um, at this point, I'm gonna bridge over to talking to um, James and I'll let James, um, start taking the screen here. How do I stop the screen? I think if I share, it'll stop yours automatically there, Jeff. So thanks for that. Let's uh, hopefully this will work without too much of a technical. So while James is kicking that up, I wanted to mention that I, I invited James because he's an entrepreneur who's actually been successful in the, in the gaming industry for a number of years. He's been very adaptive at, at, uh, at defining new technology areas in order to bring it to the gaming community. And he's the first that sort of taken this metaverse concept and actually commercialized it in the local market in a very interesting way. And I thought he offers a very unique perspective of someone who's sort of surfing at the leading edge of the wave here for, for uh, you guys to hear what he thinks is going on in the marketplace. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Yeah, everybody can hear me okay, I guess, yeah? Okay. And uh, every now and again, I'm up here in West Vancouver, and for some reason, my internet decides to take a little pause. So if you see me freeze, then everybody just wave at me frantically, and, uh, and, I'll, and I'll wait for a couple of seconds before I continue. Uh, a lot of what I want to say today, there is overlap with what Jeff's already spoken about, but I think it's useful to have a couple of different uh, viewpoints. Uh, before I get going, I just want to acknowledge that I uh, live and work and play uh, on the unceded traditional territories of the Squamish, uh, Tsleil-Waututh, the Musqueam, First Nations, and grateful for the opportunity to do that. Uh, a little bit of background on me before uh, I get going. So founder and CEO at Departure Lounge, uh, and also actually chief strategy officer at AMP right now. Um, I've been in the video games industry for over 20 years at this point. Um, and actually, I realized along the way that I'm in the video games industry, or I was in the video games industry, because... Uh, of my interest in metaverse. Uh, at university, I studied philosophy. A lot of it was about computational model of the mind and the possibilities of things like sentient avatars and uh, self-aware computers and all these kinds of things. Um, so I was pretty fortunate really when I got going with my career uh, to have a very sort of front seat vantage point for the early days of massively multiplayer online games. Uh, and Jeff touched on a couple of those sorts of, of, of types of games. Uh, as far back as 2007, um, I was a contributing author to this thing called the Metaverse Roadmap, which is quite funny, actually, because that starts in 1992, science fiction author Neil Stevenson coined the term Metaverse, right? So in some ways, it's almost exactly like we're just sort of reliving that period of time. 
Um, but it's quite interesting to see some of the projections and timelines that we uh, we actually proposed back then. Uh, I did a ton of stuff between sort of 2007, moved to Canada in 2010, started Roadhouse, did a bunch of other things. Um, and then uh, most recently, I've been splitting my time, as I said, as Chief Strategy Officer of Amped Technologies or Amped Ventures, which is a, a public company now on the uh, Canadian Securities Exchange, focused on high performance cloud and compute of the type that we think we will need to host the metaverse. And then recently, um, I uh, started Departure Lounge to bring together my interest in a, in a bunch of different metaverse initiatives, uh, but actually uh, vended that into Amped as of December. So we're all now part of the, uh, of the AMP family. Um, so at Departure Lounge, we've got this sort of four-pronged approach to creating value across that metaverse ecosystem that Jeff described, uh, all based on that foundation of the high-performance cloud and compute offering that AMP has been developing and uh, primarily split into four key uh, areas for us, tools and technologies, content and creative, utilizing those tools and technologies uh, and then actually a lot of what I'm going to talk about uh, now is, is the influence of blockchain decentralized finance and give a little bit more background on why I think that sort of tokenization and NFTs, actually the key invention that have unlocked this opportunity that we have ahead of us. And then interestingly, we have another group that's focused on real estate and you're like, well, why would a real estate company be involved in a metaverse initiative? And it's really because of that blend of real world, virtual world spaces and how they overlap with each other. So things like uh, blended concerts, blended live performance, theater in the in the metaverse, all these sorts of things. And actually in the other direction as well, where mixed reality technologies can really enhance the real world space around us. That's also very interesting for us. And in some ways, it's inevitable that those kinds of um, activities are also being generated. Uh, Departure Lounge has its own team. You know, as I mentioned, I am part of AMP, but this is the Departure Lounge team. Uh, spanning industry vets and advisors, you know, corporate development experts, uh, technology, DeFi, and creative. Um, and I won't really go into too much detail in, into all of those folks, but uh, I'll make this presentation available later and you can check into the uh, awesome team that we're putting together. Uh, and, you know, there's a fair amount of work under our belts. Right now, it's sort of track record from previous engagements, previous companies. Um, you know, my sort of, I used to say career highlight, but now I say career highlight so far. Uh, was the opportunity to work with my favorite band, Iron Maiden. And so I was the originator of the Iron Maiden Legacy of the Beast mobile game when I was running Roadhouse. And I think that's interesting in a way that it was sort of a precursor to quite a lot of what we're seeing now with bands, brands, and that intersection with interactive that's happening. You know, you might have seen, you know, stories about Travis Scott's concert in Fortnite or Ariana Grande or uh, who else, like uh, Royal Blood in Roblox recently attracting you know, audiences in the tens of millions. And so this idea of bringing uh, bands and other sorts of performances into the metaverse is definitely a key component of where we see a lot of the things moving forward. Um, tools and technologies. So I mentioned four sort of key verticals that we're trying to address. Uh, maybe this is a sort of Canadian approach. I didn't really want to start something that was sort of blue sky and was always working towards an idea. And I was pretty fortunate in a way to be able to do a deal with a company out of Los Angeles called Metastage that's been in business for around three years now. And uh, what we're doing is uh, partnering with Metastage to bring uh, the world's leading 4D holographic capture facility up to Vancouver. So the wheels are in motion for launching that in, I'd say, Q2. Uh, things are going pretty well at the moment. And we'll be operating Metastage Vancouver as the exclusive provider of the Microsoft holographic capture platform here in BC. And obviously with BC being a world leader in mixed reality, uh, we think that's gonna be a pretty good um, sort of initial foundation from which we can build the rest of, of what we wanna do. Um, you can see with volumetric capture, what's happening here is we're using 106 cameras to immediately turn human performance into uh, avatars or 3D models. Uh, Departure Lounge is actually called Departure Lounge because it's where you go for your journey into the metaverse and actually back out of it as well. Originally, we thought it was a sort of one directional thing, but again, as I said, it's it's certainly turning into a, a sort of bi-directional um, name and not only actually people any longer, longer, but also people, objects and value in and out of the real world in the metaverse as well. Uh, and so the plan is to sort of put together a synergistic pipeline of tools and technologies that do that. 
and then I guess it's almost inevitable that you would end up, you know, if you give creative folks access to these types of tools and tech, you're going to start getting creative initiatives, you know, almost developing naturally to take advantage of these types of tools and technologies that we put at their disposal. Uh, and you can see here some of the sort of amazing stuff that you can do. Um, that, for example, is a is a test of the UFC, um, you know, full volumetric capture. So you can actually be inside the, the octagon there or inside the head of one of the fighters and stuff that you could never really do with traditional video. Uh, in terms of our location, we're going to be up at Cap U. Um, uh, this actually stems back to some of the work I did when I was executive director at DigiBC. Uh, where we, we really spent a lot of time focusing on work integrated learning, academic industry partnerships, um, you know, sort of trying to address the forthcoming talent shortage in high tech and digital content creation. Um, so, you know, the sort of result of that finally is that the, the departure lounge, the real world departure lounge is going to be headquartered up at CapU uh, in about 10,000 square feet double height building there at Willow. But also, you know, we're going to have a presence across the metaverse um working with a, a local company called house of kibar and also we are the proud owners of uh land plot minus 66 199 in the sandbox which you can see right there in the middle of that little diagram and uh i'm not going to tell you how much we paid for that but uh anyway it's interesting that we want to be at the forefront of uh you know deployment both in the real world and in the digital space and there's a lot of things you can do with a virtual headquarters, and I'll, I'll look forward to letting you guys know more, more about that later on. Uh, so anyway, you know, Jeff said, come and talk about opportunities in the metaverse. Um, I've been talking a fair amount. As I said, there's a little bit of overlap in what Jeff just talked about, but I think in a way there's also some different angles there. Um, so my definition of what is the metaverse, <clears throat> you guys might be familiar with a, a venture capitalist called Matthew Ball. Uh, he's really established himself sort of as Mr. Metaverse in this space and uh, has a very, very interesting uh, website, matthewball.vc, with a ton of really great content if you want to read more. So his definition is that the Metaverse is a collective virtual shared space, um, including the sum of all virtual worlds in the Internet, in some cases blended with real life, which is a slightly different definition from what Jeff had. Um, I think you hear Web3 and Metaverse sort of used interchangeably, although there's some subtle differences, but I don't think we'll go into that too much today. Uh, but really, it's sort of like an exponential coming together of a bunch of different technologies that are really allowing what folks would refer to as the embodied internet. Uh, it doesn't need a VR headset. It can be through a 2D screen. It can be through augmented reality glasses. It can be through your phone. I've actually sort of experienced iterations of an audio metaverse, right? And so we'll go on to some of the other key components for me but definitely not necessarily virtual reality, uh, not necessarily 3D space even. Uh, but what I think is very interesting and why there's so much so much uh, investment coming into the space is, th is this, right? Basically that it serves as a functional successor to the web. So if you think about going back to 1995 at the dawn of the current internet and thinking about what you might do in terms of investment at that point, you know, we're really at that point again where almost everything needs to get reinvented for uh, for so basically becoming functional in this next chapter. Uh, and as a result of that, you know, greater reach, greater time spent, greater commercial activity, there's going to be even greater economic upside than the entire current internet. Uh, and also, even though it feels pretty bold statement, um, you know, I actually share Matthew's belief that once we get to the full realization of Metaverse, it is the next great labor platform as we transition into um sort of living, working and playing a lot more in digital environments, right? So as a result of that, huge levels of investment, um, you know, Facebook spending 10 billion a year. Some of it you look at and you go, wow, that's really crazy in terms of folks spending half a, half a you know, million dollars on a, a virtual house. But, you know, it's interesting. I think what's going on here is that uh, people are finding their way. People are starting to look at, new, you know, new path forward. Uh, and I think it really will settle down to something meaningful. Uh, I think, Jeff, you said 18 sections or something. That This is a different sort of uh, metaverse market map. This is from John Radoff, another games guy that we've known for years. He's out of the East Coast. So he's got one, two, three, four, five, six, yeah, seven, seven sections. Um, and, uh, you know, you can really see how rapidly the, the sector is burgeoning. But for me, and how I choose to look at things, I've sort of got a bit of a simpler view in a sense. 
and why I wanted to put Departure Lounge together and have it at the center of, uh, of these four key trends. So there are a couple of other things like AI and machine learning uh, that are really integral here, but I sort of choose to look at it this way. And I think maybe it's, a, it's sort of like a games industry perspective. Um, so, you know, first of all, as Jeff mentioned, developments in game technology, real-time virtual production, very key. Uh, secondly, spatial software. And third, what I think is quite important actually is how this next chapter of the web uh, can really foster and, and promote community affinity and what people are calling the passion economy. Now, what's interesting is that, you know, again, I mentioned sort of back in 2007, we were talking about Neil Stevenson and, and obviously we had things like Second Life, which, you know, had a game engine, it had technology, it had community, it had affinity. Uh, but what it lacked actually, and, and I think the key point for me, and I realized, you know, uh, relatively quickly that it was blockchain decentralized finance and sort of the whole concept of tokenization, actually, which has meant that the metaverse is, is viable now, right? Whereas it wasn't in 2003, 2004. So I'm going to spend a bit more time here actually explaining why I think that the blockchain and, and uh, NFTs and, and the invention of those sorts of things have been the key catalyst. Um, before I do that, though, I will spend a little bit of time also talking about um, some of those seven sections or the seven categories and delve in a little bit actually more into one of the ETFs that, uh, that Jeff mentioned. So this is the, it was actually called the Meta ETF until quite recently they renamed it to METV. I don't actually know how you say that. I think it's like, I don't even know. But anyway, METV, this is now the Round Hill Ball Metaverse ETF. And so this is actually Matthew Ball's own, um, or at least the, the, the ETF that he worked on with, uh, with Round Hill. And what's interesting about this actually is that you can see the sort of seven layers. Um, Back in June, or actually October, when we first sort of really started monitoring this, they only had about 300 and something million uh, dollars worth of assets under management. So you can see how quickly this is growing. Uh, but also, it's useful to see the different seven layers of, of Metaverse. And it, you know, if you look at this fund in detail, you can see that the high-performance compute and cloud component is roughly 50% of where they've allocated their assets. It's about 20% into virtual platforms and environments. Uh, like Roblox and those types of platforms. Um, fair amount going into payment, DeFi, crypto, and blockchain, types of tools and technologies. Uh, a couple of other interesting things, the top 10 holdings in that ETF for 36 times revenue, which is a great valuation, you know, when you look at it from the perspective of an entrepreneur or an early stage investor. And actually just, and incidentally, this is how Amp Ventures looks at the world as we decided to plug Departure Lounge on top of what Amp's been doing at the base. So even though, it looks like AMP's only doing sort of two of those sections. They are the primary sort of 50%, 20% of, of that ETF is still going into that, um, into these, these components of the, uh, of the seven layers. Um, Jeff talked about game technology and its advances, so I'm not going to spend very long on here. I think one interesting thing to note is that it's not actually just the game engine technology, although obviously engines have got to the point where we can do amazing things. But also, if you think about you know the design frameworks and the meta games of free to play, and the way in which that was a sort of whole new mode of engagement, um, you know there are many things that come from the games industry which is now underpinning you know more uh, sort of engagement, more economies, more frameworks across multiple sectors of society, right? And so, this video games write the first draft of history is a is a phrase that as a games industry person, you know, we really like that was coined in around 2014, I think when um, Facebook first acquired Oculus, but it's been part of the dialogue that we've had actually with the provincial government around tax credit and sort of this point that, you know, we really think that a, a vibrant video games industry is necessary for innovation in general. Um, but, you know, you can definitely plot a direct path between the virtual currencies and the soft currencies of World of Warcraft and, and some of the early stage massively multiplayer online games straight through to crypto and the, and the real developments that have happened there. You know, Brock Pierce used to have a company that used to trade World of Warcraft gold on the gray market in Hong Kong. And, you know, now he's chairman of the, of the uh, Bitcoin Foundation, for example. So, so there's many, many direct links from the innovations of, from the games industry that we can see that have become prevalent across society. And I think it will carry on. Um, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about sort of some of the other technology that we look at. This is Metastage. And it's quite useful to see how game engine 
starts to influence other um uh, other activities right so this is an advert that was created with uh pop singer called charlie xcx what's happened here is that she went down to meta stage probably spent about two or three hours uh in the green screen environment so two three hours and as a result of that it meant that she was turned into a model ready for use in whether it was a video game or any type of uh, interactive experience so what that meant was that we could bring her into engine so this is actually now that hologram inside unreal that's actually sixty thousand polygons per frame and 30 gigabytes of data per second so when you start thinking about why do we need high performance cloud and compute and a whole new type of computing that's the answer right there what it does allow us to do first of all we can start messing around with things like the illumination on the character duplication on the character transformation of the character uh but basically what's going on now is that all of the worlds that we wanted to film charlie in were created inside the game engine right and so you can see there that there's this switch between the real natural human performance and the model right so what happens is you only need talent for about two three hours maybe slightly longer than that she's done all of her performances against the green screen and now become this fully volumetric video hologram and what you can see going on here, if you, if you look at it, you can see the virtual camera. So basically what happens is the camera crew moves inside to Unreal using virtual reality headsets and film the hologram doing its performance against all of the Unreal backgrounds that had been built in advance, right? So the lighting on the stage is actually taking its cues from the Unreal game engine, lighting it for the evening or lighting it for an urban environment so that when we bring the hologram into the, into the engine, we're able to film it as though talent was there, right? So in this particular case, what's going on is that we're getting sort of four or five days of location shooting with talent, uh, even though we only needed talent for about two hours. And so that's that's probably a key, yeah, one of the key drivers there in terms of being able to move, move things forward with technologies like volumetric capture as they come to reality. And so there you can sort of see the, the output where you know, it's a single performance that's been brought into multiple game environments. Now, this one's also very interesting. You know, I think, you know, Jeff was talking about the matrix in, in terms of that being uh, probably the, the pinnacle of, of game technology. This one for me is actually Ziva. We mentioned the Ziva acquisition by Unity. And this one blows me away because it's actually a combination of artificial intelligence and machine learning, digital double technology and performance and the rigging and everything that goes into it all being rendered in real time. So I'm just going to play like two or three seconds of this just so you can see it. But I actually, for me, when I saw this one, even though I've been in the industry for 20 years, I'm like, that truly is, you know, as I said at the beginning, as you start to move towards the concept of sentient avatars and all these sorts of things, you know, it, I don't think this avatar is sentient, but it's doing a really, really good job of, of convincing you that it might be. So here's sort of four or five seconds of, of where we've got to with the state of the art. Hi, I'm a virtual human created by Ziva Dynamics. I'm powered by state-of-the-art biomechanical simulation, and I'm running in real time in Unity. But enough about me. I yeah, uh, and then obviously, you know, Game Engine is not just for game characters and those sorts of things anymore. Here's some work by one of the guys that recently joined us at Departure Lounge. This is Game Engine in architecture. Uh, this is all synthetic modeling, actually. So there's no scanning involved in anything here. It's all just synthetic. Um, what I find quite funny at the moment is this is a this is Unreal guy, right? So if you've ever got any familiarity with the Unreal game engine, this character here is the character that you get out of the box. You know, you can make him however tall you want or whatever, but basically it's Unreal guy. And there you can see him running around a, a sort of Viking metaverse block out that we've just sort of put together for a couple of things that we're up to. But what's funny is here's Unreal guy in the BMW factory of the future. So BMW worked with NVIDIA to create a full digital twin of their factory. And that sort of blends everything that you can see from a game engine in terms of very, very precise modeling. But also in this case, it's not just a visual simulation. They fully digitally twinned the entire factory so that they can work out things like, you know, position of the, of the, of the um, conveyor belts, uh, like worker health. And there you see like on real guy, actually working in this fully synthetic BMW factory so that when they build the factory for real, they know everything needs to go and everything's been optimized in advance. Uh, what I find also really cool about this is that they're training the, the, the machine vision robots 
in the virtual space, right? So here you can see this is the machine vision robot looking at a whole bunch of different, you know, uh, options and potential scenarios where, you know, it needs to recognize different things. But rather than doing that in the real world, they train it in the virtual space. And then when the real robot gets deployed, the software inside the robot already knows what it's supposed to do because it's practiced a million outcomes inside the virtual space previously, right? Okay, next thing, spatial software. I said there were four key things, so I'll go through these quickly. Now, there's a lot of debate on the internet right now. It's like, well, metaverse, metaverse, isn't it just video games, right? And so there's one thing that I really do think, again, as part of what I've been saying about the importance of blockchain. Yes, you've got Fortnite. Yes, you've got Roblox. And obviously, Roblox, massive success. Yes, you've got collectible card games and all these kinds of things. But so what's the difference, right? So here we've got this new generation of you know, Roblox-like environments, particularly the sandbox feels quite a lot like Roblox. And obviously, you know, games like Axie Infinity, where people are just sort of fundamentally battling cards against each other. You know, what is the difference? Again, I think there's two things. The first one is this move towards interoperability. And what that really means is the ability to take assets from one video game or one digital platform and move them across into another, right? Now, it's a much longer talk than we've got time for today. Uh, to talk about the challenges for game economy design and how you you know it's difficult enough to design your own game economy, well, never mind a hundred of them. If, if I could jump in, James, I, they've been telling us that uh, we're running out of time, so we have about five minutes, and uh, okay. it's, it's my fault. I talk too much, and uh, so no worries, I can go fast if that's all right. So I mean, you know, so I'll I'll, I'll go pretty quickly then. So, but what again? I, to go back to Matthew Ball's key point at the beginning. I, I really do think what's going on here is that we're practicing for non-gaming applications, right? The future of the digital work platform. Um, and I'll spend a little bit of time on this because the other reason I know that something really big is happening is because of the way in which I actually think some of what's going on right now is most likely illegal, right? So I have a fair amount of experience in uh, sweepstakes technology and sort of sweepstakes games. You know, I have a, a mobile games company that kind of pioneered the ability to give away real cash and prizes uh, through video games. And we did that uh, because if you know anything about gambling, there are three, three things that you need in order to have gambling, right? Uh, consideration or stake, you have to have chance uh, or you know, components of randomness and you have to have prizes of value, right? So in a sweepstakes, no purchase necessary, you remove consideration, you only have chance and prize. So as a result of that, that's illegal sweepstakes and McDonald's monopoly uses those rules and all these sorts of things with real gambling you, you put your money down you've got a chance and then you can win something of value now with free to play traditional free to play games the argument was well the, the prizes that you win have got no value right so you know you could have loot boxes with random number generators in them you could spend 100 hours you could spend 30 bucks 100 bucks playing that video game but ultimately you know, the traditional free-to-play guys would be, oh, yeah, but the prizes have got no value. You can't sell them to each other, and they're not, they don't have any value. Now, what's actually going on with, with Play to Earn is that all of a sudden, you end up winning stuff that can be transferred through the internet, right? So you end up, again, I think, with chance, consideration, and you get prizes of value. And as a result of that, I know that something really disruptive is happening, right? And so that speaks, again, as to why I think tokenization and NFT is the key invention, right? So on the one hand here, you've got, you know, OpenSea, $13.3 billion, right? You've got sport-focused NFT startups, you know, and folks like Dapper Labs, great local success, raising 900 million. On the other hand, you've got things like saying, well, we don't really want all of this, this, this value and all these sorts of stuff to come in into video games because it kind of messes stuff up. Now, you know, I do think that we're, we're actually living in like, the tulip mania of the 17th century at the moment where there's a lot of speculation and there's a lot of stuff going on but i you know i do think that there is really something important and why nft in the end is going to be the key invention here so i'm just going to take two minutes just to explain a little bit about nft so people don't if they don't get it so i went through this journey where i was similar i was like i don't really understand that but then what i realized was that the whole point of token is that it's almost like money that has rules associated with it, right? So you see this thing, what's a what is a token? It's a digital thing that sits on the blockchain, gets the benefits of blockchain. So it can't be copied if, if that's what the contract says, or it can be copied if that's what the contract says, 
token has a contract associated with it containing a bunch of instructions, right, at its heart. And the token can actually evolve over time. And the token wraps cultural values in a meaningful way. And so this is why it's very important. Now, this one here is, a, is an Avenged Sevenfold. I knew it wouldn't take very long for me to bring rock and metal into the conversation, but Avenged Sevenfold issued a token. And one of the key things that you can see here is that this particular death bat, of which there are about 9,000, very few of them have free tickets for life, right? But this particular style of, of death bat, if you are the owner of this, you get free tickets to watch this band for life. And each of them has different types of properties. And as a result of that, you can see why I think people are adopting NFT in a major way, right? So the other key piece that I didn't kind of understand until quite recently is how the NFT's instructions not only say, okay, every time it gets sold backwards and forwards, pay the original creator 10%, but also here's a set of instructions for actually creating that asset. So four foot high table, it's made of wood, you can break it. If I want to build that, that asset in, in the sandbox, it'll look like it should in the sandbox. So here you can see, this is a couple of examples from a local company called House of Kibar, where they've taken the instructions that are in the NFT and they've just decided to, to basically pass those instructions in a different game uh, style, right? So you could have the same item in Roblox, you could have the same item in Decentraland, you can have the same item in a much higher vigil uh, fidelity environment. And that's where the real transferability comes from, right? Now, again, challenges for game designers, but really, really mind blowing when you get around the idea that it's almost like money with instructions, right? Or any number of different instructions. So for example, last thing, and I know I've got to finish up, I just bought some tickets to go and see a band here in Vancouver. I got a free NFT. And I'm like, well, why would I get a free NFT? But imagine if you had 100,000 fans or 100,000 followers and you give them all an NFT, right? 500 of them give you free tickets for life. What's going to happen? Those are the ones that are going to start trading backwards and forwards. And every time they trade backwards and forwards, you end up making 10% as the original creator or even more. I say, look, if you watch my video content for 100 hours, or you come and play my game for 20 hours, or you go and buy, I don't know, 700 loaves of bread at the, stock, the store, I'm going to upgrade your NFT to have free tickets for life, right? And every so then you've gone and managed to have this sort of living NFT scenario where the value has been able to be generated over time. Okay, so I have a whole bunch of stuff about open versus closed metaverse. Uh, we went through that previously. I don't think it's you know, really the time to dig into this stuff. So I will just get to the end uh, where I'm talking about my conclusions and summary. So what should we invest in? So first of all, I would do a mixed approach, safe traditional investments in the picks and shovels. That's still the chip manufacturers. I would definitely buy some Qualcomm at the moment. You know, I think Qualcomm's got the potential to be the chip, chip provider of the metaverse. Uh, hardware platforms, game engines, all of those things, emerging platforms and social spaces. I think we'll see a ton of niche audience uh, like sort of passion economy things where people would will start to wrap culture that's very important to them. And I just explained how NFT allows you to do that and continue, continually generate value, right? Which is a really important piece. Interoperability, you know, Jeff touched on the concept of, of, of Web3 and a key component of Web3 is this interoperability component. Again, I mentioned House of Cuba already, they're a local company. Order Inbox is another local company working on interoperability between blockchains so that I can buy my NFT on one and not have to worry that I bought it on the wrong blockchain. You know, deep story, but that's that's really key. Uh, passion economy players. Uh, and when I mean that, I mean, what's going on, for example, is people buy like an NBA top shot card or whatever, is they're buying their way into a group of people who they share an affinity with, right? It's very interesting to see if, if you look at real world events for crypto or for NFT holders, that sense of sort of community, which is being generated by being a co-owner in, in this sort of cultural shift is very, very, to me, quite obvious and quite pervasive. Uh, and I think Holder's going to be doing a presentation later and, you know, again, sort of wrapping up uh, passion for a particular genre, a particular style of things, very interesting because the NFT now provides real value or a real direct value and a real correlation of value to, to people's sort of cultural passions, I guess. And then finally, you know, Web3 players, and particularly those people who are working to solve the issues of 
identity and data in this next chapter, uh, data transformation, very, very interesting. So uh, a little bit more reading. I'll share this with you. There's three reports that I go and refer to a lot into the metaverse, Wonderman Thompson, Future 100, and then this metaverse manifesto by Alan Smithson uh, from a company actually called Metaverse uh, out of Toronto, I think, or Ontario. Uh, and that's it. Sorry, a little bit over, but uh, there you go. It wouldn't be a James and Jeff uh, presentation or it didn't run if over. We didn't time. go over. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, why, yeah. Why break with tradition? <laughs> so, anyway. Well, James and Jeff, that was a really great show. That was fantastic content. I'm just uh, looking in the chat and I've just got such great accolades for you.